was it? Who was Charles? Who was Charles Bradley? Founder of the National Secular Society, a journalist of high repute, a Republican, radical liberal MP with legal experience that enabled him to oppose restrictive laws that forbid non-Christians from honestly entering Parliament. Who was he that changed the law? Who actually changed the law? Who was he that commanded such loyalty from the people of Northampton while the government condemned him and denied him and the people of Northampton representation in the Parliament? He did not walk away quietly. He used his knowledge of the law to oppose a law that restricted human rights. He stood his ground. He was Thurrock. Thurrock, that's where you can run the He was Thurrock. While campaigning for an extension of the franchise, he rallied massive support throughout the country. Bradlaw and his supporters organised a national petition and he presented a list of 241,970 signatures calling for him to be allowed to take his seat in Parliament. As a former soldier, he opposed the government's foreign policy and the existing wars at that time in South Africa, Sudan, Egypt and again for Afghanistan. He opposed the large state pensions and stipends given to the aristocracy. He made enemies in high places. But the people of Northampton stood by him. Three times his seat was taken from him and a by-election called. Three times he was re-elected, first in 1868 and twice in 1874, until finally, at the general election in 1880, he was again returned, dare I say, as a representative for Northampton. He suffered ridicule at the hands of the government-sponsored media. He was locked at one stage in the clock tower and later sentenced with Henry Besson to six months in prison for assisting publication of a fan book. The sentence was later squashed on the technicality. He had a significant following throughout the country and he did change the law. We know who he was, but what of the people who are happy? They, in most cases, were not the wage slaves that we are today. They had a semblance of independence and a certainty and a more inquisitive aspect of mind. They were not bound by restrictive religion or blinded by a barrage of media propaganda. They were secure, cautious deciders. It was prior to the mechanization of the shoe factory, so many of them were small, self-employed shoemakers. Many people had to negotiate contracts with bigger employers who had more money. They had to survive. They were canny, to say the least. But why did they stick with that? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Four times opposed the government and voted for him. Why did they continue to support him? It was because they knew him and what he was made of. Bradlaugh spoke from the monument in the Market Square, just down the road there. On a regular basis, Charles Bradlaugh spoke in the Guildhall. He spoke to the people of Northampton, who went to see him, and to listen to him, and to what he had to say. 
they could stand there and look up at the stage in the guild hall in Northampton and look into his eyes. They could question him and he had to answer them. So they knew what he was made of. And time and again he had to do that. And Annie Besson stood beside him as well on that same stage. They could look into his face and see what he was made of. They could ask that question direct of him and see how he handled the answer. Would we ever get that from an MP in our time? Would we ever see it? We would not. They knew him, they respected him. And when he died, they elected this monument to his memory. By commemorating Bradlaw, we are also commemorating the people of Northampton and the history of this town. I'm going to just conclude with a little poem from John Clare, who went before Bradlaw, who not many of us think was a radical, but was a radical in his nature and opposed the redistribution of the land and the break of the, of the, of the small free farms surrounding this countryside. Thus all the world belongs to man, but not to kings and lords. A country's land, the people's farm, and all that it affords. For why, divide it how you will, tis all the people's still. The people's country, parish town, they build, defend, and till. John Clare. We celebrate him on Thursday, National Poetry Day. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite Gary now to come and have a look. Thank you. So we're in our more sort of prepared place. Um, come down here to you all week. Charles Bradwell lived a difficult life. Uh, thank you very much. Right, that's... There we go, we'll start again. We'll try again. Charles Bradwell lived a difficult life. His estranged wife was an alcoholic, two of his three children predeceased him, the press, parliament, police courts and the royal family opposed him. He was libelled, jailed, attacked and harassed. What was his primary crime? He denied the authority of the Bible and for this, what is called polite society, slammed the door in his face. For daring to oppose this court, the church and state tried to ruin Charles Bradlaugh. They failed because his courage, integrity and his humanity inspired the workers in the factory and it inspired the miners toiling at the rock face. Bradlaugh's gospel was a gospel of life, of help and assistance. The church tried to deny his contribution to his era, saying his work was negative and negative work was of no value. But Bradlaugh had, as he often did, a perfectly good and sensible response. He said, like a woodsman, he cleared the ground. He dug out rotten roots and raked away weeds to clear the way so that others in the future, such as us, could plant on more fertile soil. The faithful stated that if his creed of atheism was true, then he was of no importance once he died, as that was the end of the matter. Not at all, Bradlaugh countered, saying that his life could still serve as an inspiration to others after his death. Death came to Bradlaugh at the relative young age of 57. He sleeps now in Brookwood Cemetery, beneath the gentle swaying of the trees. The church and state can hurt or slander him no more. His enemies, their thin lips drawn over sharpened teeth of bigotry, watched in impotent rage and hatred as 3,000 ordinary men and women respectfully watched this hero of humanity be lowered into the earth. He lay serene and at rest in the tunnelless silence of the dreamless dusk, having lived a useful life dedicated to social justice. And for that life and example, I pay my tribute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite Ray over now from the National Secret Society. Uh, <clears throat> I'll try to be brief. It's not one of my major attributes. Well, wow, no <laughs> <laughs> um, First of all, I'm on the Council of the National Secular Society and I'd like to start, you can't hear me just come in a bit, but I will do my best to make myself heard. Um, one of his legacies was the National Secular Society. Um, just very briefly, a couple of things that 
we've been doing over the last two years since the last time I was here. I couldn't be here last year for personal reasons. Um, shortly after I was here, two years ago, we succeeded in winning a court case in which we stopped nationally pretty well. There were some councils that were still getting away with it, largely being backed by Mr Pickles. Uh, we stopped them saying prayers as part of the agenda of formal council meetings. It got a lot of publicity and we increased our membership by something of the order of 25%. This was largely because most people didn't realise it was going on. And that's true of a lot of the work that we do. Um, the most common phone call we get into the office is, they can't do that, can they? And a lot of that recently, and in the last two years, has been to do with education and faith schools. We've just recently had calls from six formers uh, who were told they couldn't opt out of selective worship. We applied a certain amount of pressure and one of the schools involved has backed down and the other one has backed down and deeply apologised to the pupil. Education is the big issue at the moment and it's occupying a great deal of time both in lobbying in Westminster and in dealing with personal calls that come in to the office on a regular basis. We get several a week. Last time I was here, I mentioned something, but I mentioned it again. As I said, one of the legacies of Bradlaugh is the National Secular Society, which he formed in 1866. Now, in two years' time, 2016, that represents the 150th anniversary of the NSS's formation. And it's all down to this man who is standing in terracotta behind me. I told you then that we were starting to plan some celebrations. And Peter very kindly took me around the town and showed me some of the important places that were important to Bradlow and Northampton. We started moving ahead and the pace is growing. The first thing is we're definitely having a conference in 2016 which will be de dedicated to Bradlaw and his legacy. At this stage we don't have a venue, we don't have a date, but we have one speaker. And I'm working on formulating a venue which will, at the moment is looking more and more likely to be Conway Hall in Soho Square, but it's not definite. And, the spe and I'm looking for other speakers and if anybody's got any of your ideas Please, got, please talk to me. But the one speaker we have is the biographer of Charles Bradlaugh with his book Dare to Stand Alone, Brian Niblett, and he jumped at the chance, and he'll probably be speaking first. And I'm leaving the best, or I think it's the best, to last. We discovered through Keith Porteous Ward, who's our executive director, that there is something in the House of Commons called the Arts Committee. And Keith made a contact at the Arts Committee and suggested that there was no real permanent memorial, if we can call it that, to Bradlaugh and his works in the House of Commons. And he was a brilliant, as we've heard, parliamentarian on a parliamentarian that should be going down in history. With actually very little difficulty, really, we got them to agree. And they have agreed to put a bust up in the house of the bus. Not to have a bust up, they do that regularly on a Wednesday. <laughs> they've, they've agreed to have a bust made. The National Secular Society is going to be funding that to the tune of about £30,000 at the moment. And we've got ways we think we're going to be able to fund that without dipping too far into our own resources. And they are currently looking at various sculptors to see who can win on some sort of tender as to what sort of sculpture is going to be there. We have a place in one of the rooms of the House of Commons where they've agreed it would fit and hopefully that will be going up somewhere at the beginning of 2016. I'm hoping it's going to kick off our 150th anniversary celebrations. We are hoping that there is going to be some kind of ceremony for that. We are really in the house, hands of the House of Commons and the powers that be as to how many people we can attend. 
Uh, I've put it to council and they have agreed, provided that it's possible that one of your, we would be looking for a representative from your society, possibly Tony, Peter or one of the other new ones that's been assembled. I can't make that promise because we don't know how large any kind of reception is going to be. We're also hoping Brian Niblett will be able to attend. He said he would like to if it's possible. That's really all I've got to say. Um, we are still working very hard to follow the footsteps of this great man that's standing behind me in terracotta and we will continue to do so as far as is possible and as far as we possibly can to let people know about secularism, free thinking and to let them know that religion isn't to be all in the end. There are alternatives of leading a moral and ethical life. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I'd like to invite Steve to do Well, I've had a two down this week as well, but hopefully, I've had a two down this week as well, but hopefully, the paracetamol will carry on. Um, I just did this about an hour before I came here, so, and I then got it wet, um, so it's just dried out. So. <laughs> okay, the secular values that Bradlaw taught us may seem obsolete today. He championed free rule within the colonies, and this came to pass. He championed the right not to make a religious pledge in government, and this came to pass. He championed the conditions, uh, he championed the conditions and help needed for the poor and exploited uh, that saw an honest view towards welfare within Britain. The cat that also came to pass, even if sometimes in, mod in modern times today that can be uh, exploited in itself, but we won't go into that. He was very much a purveyor of welfare amongst the people. Now, these things, including, let me say, he championed the rights of women to vote and worked together, together of course, with Annie Besson in the Match Girl strike that saw the first great industrial dispute uh, to improve worker conditions and women's activism combined as one. A very important, if you don't know about the Match Girl strike, Please look it up, it it's, uh, was an important part of that time. And uh, he backed her all the way. Now, he gave a voice to atheists, free thinkers, humanists and agnostics. They would no longer need to hide their lack of belief and face up to preachers that claimed only their version of a mythical, supernatural sky boy is the one you must follow without question or discussion. He was the founder of the National Secular Society, as we have heard, and the Freethinker publication. Uh, and the resolves he made came to pass, and it seems that today secular thinking could perhaps take a rest and expect truth and reason to take its course. Now sadly today we are in need once again to stand up and speak out. Religion, once again, is creeping into the political scene and blocking out reason. It's driven by evangelical influences and a false sense of respect for belief. Belief demands respect, yet should it be given? Now, it is true that it is just and fair to respect someone's right to believe in pixies, fairies, leprechauns and demons. But that gives no right to demand respect for pixies, leprechauns, fairies and demons, any more than it does for gods. Today we find a well-organised, political, motivated religious uh, grouping that pay for student internships within political parties and offices. They also pay for uh, internships within local government and our media. They are well hidden, you perhaps hear nothing about them, but believe me, they are there. Uh, I can prove that another time. I haven't got time to explain the whole lot. But our own police commissioner here in Northamptonshire has followed that very path. These organisations promote creationist views of the world 
opposition to scientific discovery, opposition to contraception and abortion, in a world where the population increases to unprecedented proportions uh, of global resource utilisation. We find global opposition from church groups that deny the effects of people on our atmosphere and our climate. Strangely, they seem to be linked. We have these political groups promoting the second coming of Christ and have failed to see that he has apparently been here twice already. However, with that aside, uh, we want to be governed by a people who soon seemingly can't wait, we don't want to be, I should say, uh, governed by people, people who can't wait for an apocalypse to appear on our doorstep. And that is important, in my opinion. In the House of Lords, we still have 26 um, Church of England bishops. And they're given by, de this position is given by decree, it's a right to preside over the laws of Britain. These, people, these people's only qualifications are being experts in the unknowable and masters in the arts of manipulation. If 26 Muslims, Jews, Jainists, Methodists or Star Wars enthusiasts were given that privilege in this country, they would soon look up and listen. We still have faith schools being built to promote one group of god botherers over another. Although they are now hidden under the guise of free schools, which means they are not free to the taxpayer, and often, by definition, a religious school is the only place you can go to become less educated at the end than you were when you were starting. Recent faith schools' concerns have shocked many, but they can't deny that the secularists have warned for a long time about the separating of communities through education and of separating communities. Sorry, I've written it wrong. Recent faith schools' concerns have shocked many, but they can't deny that the secularists have warned for a long time about separating communities through education, and instead of replacing them with multi-faith education um, and the consequences of separation. I wish I had time to change that, but I haven't, so I think you get the gist. I've started a Three Thinkers group in Northampton, and we're looking for members. It's important that we have a say and a Religious groups, uh, I'll leave this now. The thing is, religious groups are often consulted by political parties, by the local government, by police authorities, etc. And they have things called community leaders. I don't know why, because we have a perfect um, good, good sort of uh, system where we can have councillors that are elected. However, it does seem that faith is important. And the fact that we don't have faith means we are considered as, considered as unimportant. And that is wrong, and we should be doing something about it. Even if we're just getting together on a now and again basis and discussing the way things are. Um, if you look on the meetup in Northampton, I have a meetup group, they're called North Ant Free Thinkers. Um, we meet up every Wednesday, the second Wednesday of every month. And we meet at the moment, anyway, at the Lumber Tops pub. Um, I don't know if, any, if anybody is interested in that, then fine. Uh, please ask me afterwards. But today, of course, is for Charles Bradlaugh, our inspiration, and uh, someone who showed us the way that we now need to take again. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, this is the moment where it's your opportunity. So if anybody would like to speak, uh, please come up and do so. Um, very, very briefly, I want to talk about somebody who was inspired by Charles Bradlaugh and who's very much in the humanitarian and humanist tradition of Charles Bradlaugh. And it's a man called Hastings Lee Smith, who's largely forgotten today and he deserves to be remembered. Um, he was the MP for Northampton from 1910 to 1918. In other words, he was MP for this town during the First World War. Like Bradlaugh, he was concerned about India. He was born in India and all his life he supported uh, self-determination for India. Bradlaugh was the first 
uh, Englishman to speak at the Indian National Congress, and Lee Smith was the second. Um, Start of the First World War, he, he wasn't opposed to the war initially, in fact he joined the local volunteer force in Oxford where he was a, a professor at the university. Uh, later he joined the RAMC and went to France in 1916 as a member of that, a member of the Medal of War. But he changed his mind about the war as it wore on and um, in January 1916 he opposed in Parliament the introduction of conscription. In May 1916, he seconded the motion against the Second Military Service Act, bringing in conscription for married men, and uh, he stood up in his RAMC uniform and opposed conscription in the Commons. And after that, he made common cause with what was known as the pacifist group in the Commons. They weren't pacifists, actually. They were, they were MPs who thought the war was a mistake, should never have been started in the first place, and had to be brought to an end hopefully by peaceful negotiation. And when uh, the Germans put forward terms for negotiation in December 1916, Lee Smith was very vocal in saying that that, that branch should be grasped and we should try to negotiate peace with the Germans in the middle of the war. Um, he said, if they're bluffing, let's call their bluff. Let's show the German people that they don't mean it, if that is the case. The old, he said the soldiers would welcome the negotiated peace. He always felt he was speaking on, on, on behalf of the soldiers who he knew in France. He said the alternative was a war of attrition with thousands more dead. And that if they defeated Germany through a military victory and economic blockade, which is what they were doing at the time, it would only lead to another war. How prescient that was. He called for a League of Nations and after the war was one of the leading supporters of the League of Nations. When Siegfried Sassoon, a uh, poet and British officer decorated for bravery, decided in 1917 that the war was wrong and he had to speak out and published his, or tried to publish his soldier's declaration calling for the war to be ended by negotiation, Lee Smith took that declaration to the House of Commons and read it out. So it was reported, it was in print in the Times the next day, it was printed in Hansard while the police were scurrying around print shops and confiscating it. There it was on the front page of the Times for everyone to read. <laughs> he continued to do this throughout the war. Unlike Radlaw, sad to say, he didn't win the support of the people of Northampton. There were two MPs for Northampton at the time. It was a two-seat constituency. Uh, and his fellow, at the end of 1918, they reduced it to a one-seat constituency. The Liberal Party uh, adopted his... his his fellow MP, a man called McCurdy, who was a supporter of the war, and McCurdy was elected with a huge uh, majority. Lee Smith uh, lost his seat, he later joined the Labour Party and he was a minister in some of the early Labour governments during the uh, 1930s. But he's somebody who deserves to be remembered, he was in that tradition of Bradlaw, and uh, I think the little quote I'm going to give you now, just to end up, end up with, uh, sums up that, that tradition. Lee Smith said at the height of the set of the First World War, trust yourselves boldly to those decent, kindly, humane forces which are to be found in every man and in every nation. I believe that those who put their trust in the great moral forces which lay latent in the hearts of man will find that in the long run they have never failed mankind. It was in August, I think. It was in August. I did, I found out of it two days before it actually happened, I made contact, but they didn't check my email until it came back. Um, but I have made contact with the, uh, the French, International French Federation. It's very largely run by French. Yeah, I get that impression. Catherine de Fer was the person that replied. And apparently the French actually designated the 20th of September as International Free Thinkers Day. So it all kind of comes together a little bit, you know, starting the 20th of September perhaps give us, gives us a whole week of free thinking culminating in this particular commemoration. So there's things happening, so the more you want to get involved, um, so the reason to give the leaflets as well is because there's a link there to the website and if you want to put your email in then as things happen we'll update the website and you should get those in your email. So, so it leaves me nothing else to do then but to actually thank you all for coming once again. Oh, by the way, what are you talking about? He was smiling, was he? Good. <laughs> <laughs> we need a bit of happiness. <laughs>
Um, so we look forward to seeing you all again here next year. Hopefully the weather will be just as nice. We seem to be on a streak at the moment. I think when Ray came, it was a bit blustery last night. But the week before was even wet. We actually well, changed it. I turned year. up on the wrong day. <laughs> I didn't get the message of changing. Yeah. It was down. Last year it was actually a scorcher. It really was. So hopefully the weather will be great next year. And as is the tradition, the drinks are on Peter. Okay, I look forward to seeing you next year. Have you missed that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.